So, good evening, everyone. Um, I am, um, well, first of all, I want to welcome you all and thank you for joining. Um, I am Marie-Monique Franzen and I am staff member at Oikos um, and I will be hosting this event tonight. Um, so tonight we welcome Roman Krishnarik. I think I pronounced that right. <laughs> um, a public philosopher who also write, who writes about the power of ideas to change society. Um, so before um, Roman wrote The Good Ancestor, the book we will talk about tonight, he has also written other books such as Empathy, The Wonder Box, Carpe Diem Regained, um, which have been uh, published in more than 20 languages. Um, so Roman grew up in Sydney and Hong Kong, uh, studied in the UK, where you still live, right? Yeah. Up to yep. this day? Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately. And, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Roman is also a co-founder of the world's first empathy museum and currently research fellow of the Long Now Foundation. And tonight we also invited Filsan Osman, Filsan grew up in Somalia and is currently a student in uh, African Studies and Languages at the University of Ghent, Belgium, where she also lives. Uh, Filsan also writes and she describes herself as a community builder and is also very active in Black History Month, Belgium. Right? Right. <laughs> so I want, to I want to welcome you, both of you. Um, and so this webinar fits in the Just Transition project, which is a transnational project um, in collaboration with the Green European Foundation. And the project aims to tackle the challenge of transforming our society uh, from an extractivist to a regenerative one, uh, and this in a just and equitable way. And the question on the future of the planet and the future we leave to all of our descendants, descendants is herein central. Um, so the program for tonight is the following. In the first part of the webinar, Roman will present his book to us. Um, this will take approximately 30 minutes. Uh, and then in the second part, uh, Roman and Filson will have a, a discussion or a dialogue on several um, aspects of the book for about 20 to 30 minutes. And after that, there is a room for a Q&A. Um, so make sure you post all of your questions uh, in the chat box below. So just one last thing um, for good comprehensions, comprehension, make sure you keep your microphone muted so that we don't hear any background noises. Um, I think that's it for now. Um, and so I leave the floor to you, Roman. Well, thank you so much for that uh, introduction. And um, um, it's also a great pleasure to be here with Filsan as well. And I'm looking forward to our conversation afterwards. But I guess the place to begin is, well, if you're thinking about how do we shift from a degenerative, extractive society and economy to a regenerative one, I think one of the ingredients we must talk about is time and how we extend our time horizons because it is clear that we are held back in so many ways by the tyranny of the now, our obsession with the present. We now, our politicians can barely see beyond the next election or even the latest tweet. Businesses can't see beyond the quarterly report. Markets spike and crash in speculative bubbles and nations sit around international conference tables bickering away while the planet burns and species disappear. Maybe they'll do something different at COP26, but maybe they won't. And of course, as individuals, we are, you know, looking at our phones and clicking the buy now button. We are immersed in the present tense. And I think we know that even in this period of immediate COVID crisis, that we need long-term thinking to deal with the challenges of our time. We need it to plan for the next pandemic that might be on the horizon get our public health systems in order. We need it to deal with racial injustice, which gets passed on from generation to generation, embedded in policing systems, judicial systems, and in other cultural institutions more broadly. We need long-term thinking to deal with technological threats, 
from artificial intelligence or bioweapons, many other things. And of course, we need long-term thinking too to deal with the global ecological crisis from climate change to biodiversity loss, ocean acidification and other areas. In a way, there's a kind of paradox here that the need for long-term thinking is incredibly urgent. You know, we need it right here, right now. And one of the ways I think about this is that I believe that humankind has colonized the future, that we treat the future like a distant colonial outpost where we can freely dump ecological damage and technological risk as if there was nobody there. And I come to this sort of metaphor of colonizing the future because I'm Australian, you know, and, and, and knowing a little bit about Australian history, recognizing that when Britain colonized Australia in the 18th and 19th century, they drew on a legal doctrine now known as terra nullius, you know, the Latin for nobody's land, terra nullius, the idea that there were no indigenous people there, so they could just take it. Of course, there were people there. And I think just as today, there are still struggles going on against this doctrine of terra nullius, the way that lands have been occupied, colonized, there's also a struggle to be had against tempus nullius, the way that we treat the future as a kind of empty time, a place that has, that is devoid of inhabitants and that is ours for the taking. And I think the tragedy in a way is that future generations who are being colonized aren't here to challenge this pillaging of their inheritance. You know, they can't you know, go on a salt march to defy their colonial oppressors like Mahatma Gandhi or stage a sit-in like a civil rights activist. They have no political rights or representation. They have no influence in the marketplace. And I think it can be quite difficult really to grasp the scale of this injustice. So you can see on the image there one way I think about this, that there are 7.7 .7 billion people alive today. And over the past 50,000 years, an estimated 100 billion people have been born and died. But over the next 50,000 years, an estimated nearly 7 trillion people will be born in that giant orange circle. I mean, in the next two centuries alone, tens of billions of people will be, bo be born. Amongst them, all your grandchildren, if you have them, and their grandchildren and the friends and communities on whom they'll depend. And so there's a real question here of how will those future generations remember us for the choices we did or didn't make? And someone who really thought about this issue a lot was the immunologist Jonas Salk, who were, with his team developed the first polio vaccine back in the 1950s. And he said, there's one great question facing our civilization today, which is this, are we being good ancestors? In other words, how are we going to be remembered by those generations to come? And he believed that if we were going to be remembered well, and if we were going to tackle the long-term challenges, such as the destruction of the living world or the nuclear threat, which was big in his time, he said, then we would need to expand our time horizons. And instead of thinking on a scale of seconds, minutes, and hours, we should think on a scale of decades, centuries, and millennia. And in some ways, there's some really inspiring long-term, long-time horizon projects around. You know, you might already be starting to think of some yourself, but let me give you a couple of examples. Um, so here's one, the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, which is collecting millions of seeds in an indestructible rock bunker in the Arctic Circle, which is designed to last for a thousand years, preserving the world's plant biodiversity. Or another example is the 10,000 year clock, which is a slow time clock currently being built in a mountain in the Texas desert. And it's been designed to last for 10 millennia, stay accurate for 10,000 years. And it's a project of the Long Now Foundation where I'm a research fellow. And um, it's, a, it's in a way, it's about a cultural icon for getting us to take responsibility for future uh, generations to get us to think way beyond uh, the here and the now. Now, as I've been speaking, you may well have been thinking of some long-term projects that you might know about, and I'd love you to do me a favor. I would like you to open the chat box and just write down in a couple of words any long-term thinking projects that you know about 
uh, that you think are powerful or inspiring. They could be from the realm of uh, the art or ecology or economics or something else. Because I just love to see uh, some examples of the kind of things that you're thinking of. One that I came across the other day um, is, is a, a 639 year um, music performance um, in, in, Halb in Halb uh, Halberstadt, I think a city in Germany, where they're playing the organ. It's a John Cage piece lasting 639 years. Uh, look, there's people have been writing there. Ava's written uh, soil, yes, so, uh, yes long-term soils. The renovation of a cathedral in Utrecht take a hundred years. I'll talk about cathedrals in a moment. Uh, Google's projects for digitizing all those books, which might show you that long-term thinking isn't necessarily always good for us. Ah, Eco Cathedral. Maybe you're thinking the Eco Cathedral um, famous project in, in the Netherlands, um, which I think was started in the 1960s, and they now have a 1,000 year um, plan for the, the Eco Cathedral development. So there's all sorts of examples that you might know about, you might come up with. Um, ah, there's someone in Aotearoa, New Zealand, saying here that the um, I Iwi tribes see a complete business planning for hundreds of years instead of the Western approach to five to 10 years. It's a really interesting example. In fact, I came across uh, um, a sustainable food company in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, a Maori company. I can't remember what it's called. It begins with K, but it has a, they have a 500 year sustainability plan. And hopefully I'll remember it by the time we get to the Q&A. But um, thanks for that example, Claire. So there's all sorts of really inspiring examples out there, but there's a real question of, Clearly, we're not doing enough of this long-term thinking. Otherwise, we wouldn't have these, the climate crisis and so many other long-term crises. So how do we become long-term thinkers? Well, I think that one of the starting points is that we need to look inside our own heads. And I believe there's a kind of like a, a struggle going on in our brains between the drivers of short-termism and long-termism. You know, do I party today or save for my pension for tomorrow? Do I upgrade to the latest iPhone or plant a seed in the ground for posterity. And I think of these two parts of the brain as the marshmallow brain and the acorn brain. And the marshmallow brain is the part of our brain which focuses on short-term rewards and instant gratification. That's the bit which is all about clicking the buy now button. Um, and it's named after the famous, by the way, I can see other things coming up in the chat and I, I hope we can come back to them uh, later, such as the Sahel tree planting projects. So the marshmallow brain is named after the famous marshmallow test in the 1960s, where a marshmallow was put in front of kids. And if they could resist eating it for 15 minutes, they were rewarded with a second marshmallow. And the majority couldn't resist and ate the snack. But the marshmallow test has been critiqued in many ways. And one of the reasons I critique it is because it forgets that there's another part of our neuroanatomy, which is this acorn brain. This is the part that focuses on long-term thinking and planning and strategizing. It lives here in the frontal lobe, particularly a part called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And this acorn brain, as I call it, is better developed in humans than most other creatures. So chimpanzees, for example, do plan for the future. So they might get a stick, take off the leaves and turn it into a tool to stick into a termite hole. But they will never make a dozen of these tools and set them aside for next week. But that's exactly what a human being will do. We are long-term planners extraordinaire. Our minds can dance across time horizons. That's how we save for our pensions or write song lists for our own funerals. It's how we built the Great Wall of China or voyaged into space by using this acorn brain. But there is a question then, okay, we've got this neurological capacity, let's say, but how do we switch on this acorn brain? How do we become better long-term thinkers? And in my book, I explore this, uh, my book, The Good Ancestor, which has recently come out in Dutch as, as well as in English. I talk about something called the tug of war for time. And on one side are six drivers of short-term thinking. Many of them are familiar, like digital distraction or political presentism, like sort of short-term electoral cycles. Some of them are more ancient, like the tyranny of the, of the clock, the way that clock time over the last 500 years has been speeding up our lives and been diminishing the future. You know, the first clocks used to chime every hour, but by 1700, most clocks had minute hands. By 1800, they had second hands. The clock became the key machine of the Industrial Revolution, the, the assembly line, the factory clock. We've been speeding it up ever since. But on the other side are six ways to think long term. And I want to talk just about three of those 
um, cathedral thinking, intergenerational justice, and developing a legacy mindset. Now, cathedral thinking is all about the idea of embarking on long-term projects and policies with very long time horizons, stretching decades, centuries ahead, beyond the lifetimes of those who started them. As someone wrote in the chat, they, they mentioned the, the rebuilding of, uh, of, of Utrecht uh, Cathedral, I think. And, um, you know, of course, there are lots of different kinds of cathedral thinking. Greta Thunberg has famously said, you know, we need cathedral thinking to deal with the climate crisis. But let's look a little bit more at cathedral thinking, because there are different kinds of examples. One example in the left-hand corner there you can see is Ulminster in southwest Germany, which was begun in the year 1377, when the citizens of Ulm decided they wanted to build and finance a cathedral themselves. It wasn't finished until 1890, more than 500 years later. So a kind of um, probably the world's longest crowdfunding project. On the right hand side, you can see a public works project from Britain in the 19th century. These are the sewers built after the great stink of 1858. Until then, raw sewage had been dumped in the Thames River. Tens of thousands of people would die from cholera each year. And, um, but after the smell was so bad in the summer of 1858, the government passed emergency legislation. The sewers were built over a period of 20 years with 22,000 workers. The chief engineer made sure that the, the pipes or the tunnels were twice as big as they needed to be for the population at the time. And that's why those sewers are still in use today. Kind of sewer thinking rather than cathedral thinking, but very long-term vision. And the bottom left-hand corner is just a reminder, that image there from the civil rights movement in the US, that cathedral thinking is also evident in long-term um, political and social struggles. The struggles for indigenous rights, women's rights, rights of people with disabilities, all sorts of struggles for rights often take decades, sometimes half a century to achieve their aims. They require long vision. Now, all these examples I find really inspiring. Of course they are. They show we can do this. We can think long term. But there is a danger because cathedral thinking isn't always good for us. It can be used for very narrow and self-serving ends. Think about the regime in North Korea, which wants to maintain power from generation to family generation, passing it down. Or think, oh, I forgot to tell you, show you one of my favorite examples of cathedral thinking. Let me just show you this quickly because I love it so much. The, these two power plants in Japan, the right hand one was the Fukushima power plant, um, which was destroyed in the, in the tsunami of 2011. You can see it went into meltdown, the fire there. And on the left hand side is another plant called Onagawa, which survived the tsunami. It was even closer to the center of it. Why? Because the chief engineer built a, a wall much higher than regulations asked for and then put the uh, the plant itself another 15 meters higher. So in fact, when the tsunami hit, local people sheltered inside that nuclear power plant, it survived. Amazing cathedral thinking. But as I said, cathedral thinking isn't always good for us. You've got this problem of authoritarian regimes wanting to pass on power from generation to generation, but also in the corporate world. Here's a quote from a former head of Goldman Sachs, Gus Levy, who said, we're greedy, but long-term greedy, not short-term greedy. Well, that's not the kind of cathedral thinking I think that we need both people and planet to help all future generations to ensure our long-term survival. We need to combine, therefore, cathedral thinking with other approaches to thinking long. And one of them is intergenerational justice, which is about thinking, what are our responsibilities to future generations? How do we inject long-term thinking into our political decision-making structures? And I have to uh, admit here that, you know, I used to be a political scientist back in the 1990s, apparently an expert on democracy, so I was told, but never once did it occur to me that we fail to give, systematically fail to give voice to future generations, that they are kept out of the demos, the what counts as the people who is, whose voices are allowed to be heard. Um, how do you, though, listen to the voices of future generations and bring them into politics? Well, Somebody mentioned there in the chat examples like ombudsmans for future generations, like they've had in Israel and Hungary. Wales has a future generations commissioner. I'm particularly inspired by the Native American idea of seventh generation decision making, a kind of ethic of ecological stewardship. It's a lovely quote from Chief Oren Lyons from the Iroquois Confederacy, who says, we are looking ahead 
as is one of the first mandates given us as chiefs to make sure every decision we make relates to the welfare and well-being of the seventh generation to come. And that's the basis by which we make decisions in council. Will this be to the benefit of the seventh generation? Now, it's a beautiful idea, but people sometimes say to me, they say, oh, well, that's all very nice for Native American communities, but what if you're living in the fast-paced world of Miami or Shanghai or Dubai? You know, this is just doesn't make sense. And I think, well, actually, it's really interesting how many movements around the world in different places have been inspired by the seventh generation idea. Here's one, a movement, uh, an organization in the United States called Our Children's Trust, which is a public interest law firm which has filed a landmark legal case against the US federal government, also at state level, on behalf of the 21 young people you can see there who are campaigning for the legal right to a safe climate and healthy atmosphere for both current and future generations. This is one of the most extraordinary shifts in, in the nature of rights since the French Revolution, rights for people who may not be born for decades from now. And this is a David versus Goliath struggle. You know, it's going to take years, but our children's trust and these young people here called the Juliana 21 are inspiring landmark lawsuits worldwide in Uganda, uh, in Colombia, and in many other countries as well. In fact, you might know that there's currently a case where six young Portuguese people are, have, uh, uh, youths have taken 33 European countries to the European Court of Human Rights for violating or, or, or you know, for failing to act on the climate emergency. So there's really interesting work here in the uh, legal sphere. And also, of course, not just rights for future people, but rights for the living world is becoming increasingly important. There was someone in the chat there from Aotearoa, New Zealand, where the Wanganui River, for example, has been given the same legal rights as a person, or equally in India, the Ganges and Yamuna rivers. So they're really important legal changes. And our children's trust directly inspired by the seventh generation principle. But here's an organization in Japan, also inspired by the Iroquois seventh generation principle, and it's called Future Design, directly inspired by the Native American uh, ecological stewardship ideas of long-term thinking. And Future Design is about local government decision-making. And what they do is they invite local people to discuss and draw up plans for the towns and cities where they live. And they typically split them into two groups. Half of them are told their residents from the present day, and the other half are given these ceremonial robes to wear that you can see there and told to imagine themselves as residents from the year 2060. And it turns out that the residents from 2060 systematically advocate far more transformative plans for the city from healthcare investment to climate change action. And future design is now moving and growing and is being used in big cities like Kyoto, Japan's Ministry of Finance, companies like Fujitsu, and why not bring it to Belgium, to Ghent, to Brussels, bring it all across Europe, start using this and combining it with the really important energy behind citizen assembly movements to inject more long-termism into those deliberative democracy processes. And this is really all about giving a voice, finding imaginative ways to give a voice to the generations of the future. There are other ways of doing it. I recently came across this uh, example from the UK um, renewable energy company, Good Energy. They're setting up a, a board, a, what they call the Good Futures Board, which will be made up of teenagers who will be advocating for the rights of future generations uh, and speaking and advising the company and the, the regular board of directors. Now, I don't know how much power they're gonna have, Maybe it'll be symbolic, let's see what happens. But I think this is a really good uh, and, and creative initiative. So that's intergenerational justice. But I wanna just finally talk about the idea of developing a legacy mindset. Now, thinking about legacy, I think is really fundamental here because clearly we are the inheritors of very uh, extraordinary legacies from the past that we benefit from in many ways, some sectors of society like medical advances, made in the 19th century, we still benefit from. But then we're also inheritors of very negative and destructive legacies. Legacies of slavery, slavery and colonialism and racism that are creating and do create deep inequities that must now be repaired. Or legacies of economies that are structurally addicted to fossil fuels and endless growth that must now be transformed. And I guess the challenge here is to think about, okay, well, what, which legacies are we going to pass on? Some we want to pass on and some we don't, right? 
But there is a, a challenge on top of that, which is really making that sense of visceral connection with those future generations who are out there decades, maybe centuries from today. How do we make that connection and think about the kinds of legacies we want to leave them? Well, in order to do that, I think we need to tap into that acorn brain and our capacity to dance across time in our minds. And I'd love to take you on a little imaginative thought experiment. So if you'll do this for me, just, we'll just take a couple of minutes. I'd like you to close your eyes and I'd like you just to imagine with your eyes shut a young person in your life who you really care about. It could be a little brother or sister or your own child or grandchild or a nephew or niece. Just picture their face. And now with your eyes still closed, I'd like you to imagine them 30 years in the future. Just pause for a moment and think about the joys they might be experiencing or the struggles they may be facing. And now with your eyes still shut, I'd like you to imagine them on their 90th birthday party. They're 90 years old and they're surrounded by family and friends and loved ones and old work colleagues and neighbors. Now, what are they looking at outside the window? What kind of world is it out there? And now somebody comes over and puts a tiny baby into their arms. It's their first great grandchild who they know could live well into the 22nd century. And now this 90 year old is about to give the birthday speech, their birthday speech, but instead of giving a speech, suddenly they see a photograph of you over on the table. And instead they decide to tell the gathered room about the legacy that you left them, their departed ancestor, the legacy you left them and that you left for the world they live in. Just think for a few moments, about what they said in their speech about you, their departed ancestor. And now I'd like you to open your eyes once again, come back to the present moment. Now, I know that for some people, that kind of imaginative journey, short though it was, can be very confronting, particularly if you have a, a dark vision of the future. But I think it's one important way we can try and connect on a personal level, because certainly the way I think about this is, look, if I imagine I've got twins who are 12 years old. Now my, uh, you know, my daughter, you know, when she's 90 years old, it'll be like nearly, the 20, you know, nearly 2100 or 2098. Um, and when I think about her in that year in 2098, well, I realize that she's not alone when I do that imaginative exercise. She's part of a community, the web of people and community that support her, but also the web of the living world, the air she breathes and the water she drinks. So what I'm trying to say here is that, look, if, you, if I care about her life, then I need to care about all life, you know, in a way, that imaginative journey into someone from your own life, your own family perhaps, is a bridge to something more universal, which is about caring about the universal strangers of the future and the world that they live in, the planet, the living world that they're part of. So I think this kind of legacy imagining can help us take our minds out of the present tense. And there's some really, I think, powerful projects, particularly art projects actually, which help us do exactly this and think about our legacies. Let me show you one of them. This is the Future Library, a 100-year art project developed by the Scottish artist Katie Patterson, where every year for 100 years, a famous writer is donating a book which will remain completely secret and unread in the Future Library until the year 2114, when the 100 books will be printed on paper made from a thousand trees which have been planted in a forest outside Oslo. Many well-known writers have donated books so far, Margaret Atwood, uh, Elif Shafak, Hong Kong, the 
South Korean novelists, and they're never going to see those books published in their lifetimes. And it really raises a question, I think, for each of us about the kinds of legacy gifts, the different kinds we might want to leave, uh, depending on who we are, for all those generations to come. But ultimately, stepping back, I think what I'm talking about here is expanding our time horizons. It's about moving away from the seconds and minutes of that buy now button and 24 seven news and the ups and downs of the stock market to thinking on that scale of not just years, but decades, centuries, and even millennia. Increasingly, we're living our lives in those seconds and minutes right at the top of that image you can see there. And we need to try and extend down it towards those longer time frames. It's difficult to do in a moment where people are faced with the tragedies and traumas of COVID-19, but there are these very long-term challenges facing us. And I think in a way, if we're gonna have a, a symbol to guide us, I'm gonna show you something that my daughter just gave me just to finish off. This is a, an acorn. This is gonna grow into an oak tree. And she took a, an acorn and put it in tissue paper until it germinated and then put it in this glass and if you can just look at those incredible roots growing, this has been growing since December the 21st, since the winter solstice. It's gonna stay in here for one year before it's, I plant it out. And then it may well survive for hundreds of years, will be here long after me and my children are dead. But it is, I think, in a way, the ultimate symbol of what we need to do as a society. Look, you can have all the sustainable development goals in the world, you can have all the good intentions in the world, but if you are still just caught in short-term cycles, politically, economically, uh, socially, then it's going to be very difficult. We need to become the acorn planters of the future. And with that, I'd like to stop and I look forward to talking to Filson and seeing where the conversation goes. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much. I think that was very inspiring. And uh, I must say the acorn that your daughter gave you is really a beautiful gift. I remember when I was, well, I don't remember it because I was just born, but my family planted a tree as well. And uh, it's, it's big now. <laughs> um, and so I think uh, in this that the, what I find really central in, in your talk is the idea that, that we need new values and new goals for our societies and in that sense um the the, the paradigm shift that we need um it's really the most important uh aspect if we want to really and um, have this radical changes that we need both on a social level environmental level um and in 1972 in the report of the limits to growth donella meadows also she wrote a text on so places to intervene in a system. So where, if you have a system, what are the most important places to intervene to change it? And she said, well, the, the, the mindsets of the people, that's the hardest to change, but it's also the most important. And I think that's, that's really, really central here. Um, and on the, yeah, also this meditative exercise is very powerful because it, gives you an emotional connection. It ties you to the past and to the future, and it becomes something really tangible. And I was wondering, uh, Filsan, what your take was on this, on this, this, uh, yeah, this connection that ties you to past and future, and what this means for, 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 yeah, for our descendants. Yeah, well, that bit got me, I must say, quite emotional. <laughs> If I'm being honest, because it's a, it's a kind of exercise we do a lot. Um, I am from a communal background, and um, for us, uh, ancestors are very present. They are present um, even when they are physically not uh, around, and that very idea of um, their presence makes you think a different in a different way. At least if you're raised in that way. Uh, so when I first came to Belgium 10 years ago, uh, it was very, <laughs> very weird for me to be um, all of a sudden quite um, afflicted with the level of individualism uh, that I sought to, 
to try and create community ever since. Like I, I couldn't um, place that idea of being or being living for myself or um, just being alive for uh, the 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 very the needs that are quite right there in front of my face and not actually thinking about what it is that that uh, my existence actually means and uh, that was easier to do back home because i felt like there was proximity so there's this thing my grandmother used to tell us a lot um when we were a little bit too caught up <laughs> with the world she would tell us uh, to always imagine ourselves so this is the form of the exercise we would do so we would always imagine ourselves in a long line um, of uh, where we would stand as a family, like the family member. So if you were the first born to your father or your parents, then you would stand at the first and then followed by your siblings and such. Which, and then she would say, look to your left and then look to your right. And in front, you, you would see your ancestors and then you would see your descendants. And because both are present, it means you're okay. Because your ancestors are present, it meant you're okay. If your descendants were present, it meant you are fine in this time and it was it's a it's, it's an exercise i found myself doing a lot <laughs> um just to kind of reorient myself when i came to belgium so this idea of uh finding a connection i guess is is, is quite um integral and essential to me because even right now we are preparing for black history month belgium in uh, and we're talking about archiving we're talking about history and we are talking about, um, and we managed, we decided to take it all the way back. So to try and see how we archived before uh, the disruption of colonial, um, of colonialism, and it was oral. And so history embodied in the person, legacy embodied in a family. And so this idea just speaks really, really deeply to me in a way that um, I think makes it easier probably for me to do the exercise and come and connect on that level. So I guess my question would be then, um, how do we make it more tangible for, for, for folks to understand and see where, what we're trying to say when we say, uh, let's think about the legacy we're leaving behind and how integral and important that legacy is and can be uh, for generations uh, to come? Well, I love that question. And um, the exercise that you're or what your grandmother said to you is incredibly powerful and very, very beautiful as well. And it, it reminds me of, uh, I was speaking to um, one of my cousins who is half Maori. And, you know, they talk about this concept of uh, papa, which I think is the word for genealogy or lineage. The idea that you're all, you know, in that, that idea in a great chain that goes long into the past and, and far into the future and the light happens to be shining on the here and now and i think what we need to do is you know shine that white light more brightly which is as you were saying it's sort of turning left and turning right uh, and seeing yourself as part of that line and i guess well in fact you just asked me the question that i really wanted to ask you you know which is how how do we try and make that kind of ancestral connection and thinking stronger when i think particularly in western society when we're so severed and kind of cut you know cut by consumer culture cut by the self-help industry all these things which keep us in a very narrow sense of what who i am you know there's no connection between me and the generations in the past and the generations in the future there's no connection for me culturally between me and the living world, or it's very, you know, one has to work hard. You know, I can look out the window of, of my study where I am now, and I know there's an, a beautiful ash tree there, and that tree creates enough oxygen for four human beings. So it's my external lungs. I kind of know that on an intellectual level, but do I feel it? It's hard to feel, like it's hard to feel that the living and the dead and the unborn are all here in the room with me. And, you know, maybe the answer to the question partly is just for us to be talking like this, you know, to know that people have 
even in Western culture, it wasn't so long ago that people, a lot of people felt embedded in communities and families um, and could, you know, a lot of people are interested in family history, for example, they can, you know, draw the lines, you know, but it doesn't necessarily connect them with the, with the future. And can I say one final thing? I had this really interesting talk the other day with a Buddhist monk um, uh, called Shokai Matsumoto. He's a very famous Japanese Buddhist monk. And he was saying that he'd, he'd read my book, The Good Ancestor. And what struck him was that in Japanese Buddhist culture, where there's a strong culture of ancestor worship and connection, he said, to be honest, we don't really look forward so much. We do a lot of looking back and not as much looking forward. And maybe we need to look more forward. So I'm interested in your thoughts on your thoughts, really, on how do we make the connection closer? Maybe that's what partly you're doing with Black History Month and other things. Yeah. Um, in, for Black, at least for, for, for diasporic Africans, um, the idea behind uh, connecting with our histories is kind of introducing disruption um, to the linear modes of thinking, of, of, of Western thinking. So um, through art, through, uh, through just ex the idea that we exist in and of themselves in these uh, very, um, um, in these communities uh, or in, in, as part of the structures that honestly try every day to, to, to for lack of a better term, kill us. So there is, um, there's this idea that you're always standing on something. You're never on your own. There's nothing about you that is, in the, that is, that is not informed by where you come from and who you are. Um, where you come from uh, in, the, in, in your lineage, but also where you come from in your community. Uh, Somalis have, um, maybe people would think that, <laughs> that this might be a bad idea, but Somalis have uh, tribes uh, in, in that, uh, we can trace all the way back to uh, the uh, your tribal mother. So, I just by calling your name. So, just by saying my name is Filson Omar Esma, I'm telling you who my father, grandfather, great grandfather, great great grandfather is. And in that way, there is also already a connection. So every time you say my name, you're saying you're invoking my ancestors. There is this also idea that um, whenever you need help or whenever you are you are um, you are uh, confronted with a decision that you just invoke the people who are there before you. You invoke their strength. You invoke um, all the things that they left behind. You invoke their legacies, and you you kind of put yourself in perspective that way because you're like they were they've been through worse and they survived i have been through worse and i've survived and um and the fact that i'm still here means that this problem is not going to be some a problem that i cannot solve it just needs me to kind of um frame it in a way that makes it solvable um so for me i think the the biggest thing that i noticed at least the difference that i noticed when i came to belgium was proximity uh proximity to elders and, 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 and intergenerational proximity was not something that, <laughs> that I found quite quickly in Belgium. Uh, first of all, they were entirely, the, the, they were entirely way more um, older people uh, than I'd ever seen in my life, <laughs> but they were always grouped together away from one another. And so young people always group together away from one another. And there was kind of, there is no way in which the generations can inform one another because there is a, there's this idea that maybe, uh, yeah, their time has passed and it's our time now. And then this very, very, um, this concentration or this um, fetishization of youth. Uh, and then we, uh, and in, in that process also forget, forgetting what, 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 um, being old can mean uh, in our in, in our cultures you are you're surrounded by your 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 extended family you're surrounded but i grew up with my grandmothers and my great grandmothers and my grandfathers they were all there they were all there from the time i can remember i would look around and see them so they taught me some of the most important things that i i consider my life right now my grandmothers taught me how to pray it wasn't something my parents did it was my grandmothers um, so there's this uh, connection that I will always have that is very visceral and very real um, uh, with the different generations of my family. I am the oldest of nine, ch nine children, 
uh, um, and then if you add step brothers and step sisters, we are almost twenty, and the youngest is ten, and I just turned thirty. That um, the fact that she is someone that I can even um, that, that I connect with all the time, that I keep in contact with all the time, keeps uh, that that legacy going. So I think for me. I, I don't know what play, I think proximity really, really does play a very big role. Uh, that um, idea of bringing um, people back into the family home. Like today, uh, earlier we had this, uh, that I, I mentioned that we were doing, we were looking for uh, homes and we went to ask for advice, <laughs> for advice. And we just happened to be, it just happens to be us and our, our, and our mother. And they were like, oh, it's going to be very hard because <laughs> if you were, <laughs> If you were, if it was your mom and her husband and her kids, it would be much easier. But it's because it's your mom and her kids, it's going to be much harder. And I, I, I was like, what, what, why, why, why would it be much harder? Then she, she, she um, the, the person advising us was said, well, it's because, <laughs> it's because you will find you would you would want to get a family and you would leave the home. And I looked at her, <laughs> I said, but no, no. <laughs> Can I just say, on the other hand, you know. That, that often there's a lot of conflict between generations too, because, you know, I know a lot of young people in the UK who are very angry with the older generation who <laughs> voted for Brexit, who don't care about climate change, uh, who, uh, and they say they're, they're, you know, they don't care about the fact that we can't afford our housing and we're now we've got these enormous debts to deal with. And there are these sort of challenges too between the generations. Yeah, but I think, but this, isn't that also a little bit informed by the idea of proximity? Because we live so much apart from one another, our values and ideas are also going to kind of uh, um, um, progress apart from one another. If if you're uh, if somebody if someone older than you kind of has the idea or is also raised in that communal uh, idea that they are whatever they leave behind is for you and you for your descendant, then that kind of eases a bit of that um, friction. Most of that friction is coming from, uh, again, that idea that we are individuals. And so even when you have this, when you, when you talk right now, even when you're talking about um, student debt crisis in the United States, you have people saying they don't want Biden to cut the student debt crisis because they had to pay it. And it wouldn't be fair <laughs> if people in generations after them didn't have to pay it. And you have to, like, I had sometimes, I would put on my phone and think this is the most mental thing I have ever <laughs> heard. What, like, why would you not want that? So yes, I, I, I do understand that there, there are some problems between the generations, but I honestly, honestly also do believe that that is informed by proximity. I feel like um, if there was more dialogue, those things would, 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 Pro progress a different way, they would move a different way, it would feel different, it would be palatable in a different way. Um, I'm not saying that it's, it's a perfect model of, 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 of living, I'm just saying that um, from what I have come across, it, is, it has worked best for me and what I'm finding in activist circles and within the Black community and the diaspora, African diaspora is that need uh, to go back to that um, to at least draw inspiration from that way of organizing uh, society, um, a more open and honest conversation between the generations for the betterment of the ones who are not yet here. Because one of the other things that also strikes me in this area is just the fact that if you think far enough into the future, well, the future is going to be inhabited by young people, older people, whatever, everybody, right? And they all need the same basic things, you know, when it, when it comes, I mean, at the, at the most fundamental level, and that is to be able to be within a biosphere in which they can survive, you know, to, to have the air to breathe and the, and the water to drink. And that in a way goes back to what um, Monique was talking about, the limits to growth and Donella Meadows, you know, at some fundamental level, um, when we see that world um, and that world that is coming, that we need to be thinking in this very holistic way about our fundamental values, about what we share. And of course, as Donella Meadows was saying about working on that paradigm level, what are the values that we care about? But I think these, we need different, we need many, many kinds of values, I think, for a, a long-term sustainable future. But those family ones that you're talking about, I think is a really good example of they can be very personal. 
you know, the values of family and community and, and faith and all those things, which connect with that larger one about the value of being, you know, having a responsibility for people and planet and generations to come, like that seventh generation ideal. If I can just uh, say something, I think that this is also, for me, the example of the, the student marches um, for the climate marches is just, it really shows this, this kind of, yeah, these severe ties in, in, in a certain way to me, because it's really, for me, it felt like they really didn't feel understood. Like they really, the students who were marching on the streets for, for their future really felt like, hey, what are you doing? And this, like you say, Philson, this connection or these, these dialogues that are sometimes missing, if, if young people, for example, are not, uh, into, they're not uh, integrated in the political system, they can't vote, they, whereas it's really about their future. And I think this is really a, an important friction that is, yeah, that we, can, we need to overcome. There was another book that I was actually reading quite along the same lines as The Good Ancestor um, that was written by Adrian Marine Brown about emergent strategy, strategy that I read earlier um, last year and where she tries to, <laughs> I don't live alone, <laughs> I live with a lot of people and sometimes they're noisy so please excuse them. <laughs> Um, so she was talking about uh, emergent strategy as a re re response to the natural that the natural world has to the existing environment that it finds itself. And it's very community based and um, it's creating resilient, robust community outside of the structures that exist. So I think um, I don't know if um, we can always only rely on the structures that do exist to kind of change and form themselves in a way that make um, the change that we need possible i think there's also got to be a kind of uh, um, grassroots bottom up kind of way of looking at how we can organize community and organize ourselves um, in a way that makes these um, robust and resilient futures possible because all of the solutions that you propose in the book are quite the in scale <laughs> very big and it can be hard to kind of um uh vision uh, to see that if if what if what you're used to is living um is kind of always getting changed from the top bottom and and i think that's what the students who were when 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 protesting all over the world for the cl for climate change or trying to get everyone to see it's like we cannot wait for existing structures to kind of move these things further. We also have to, um, as citizens of the world, kind of um, come together and kind of uh, create communities that, 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 that do not necessarily um, need to be informed by, by existing structures. I don't know if you agree uh, that change has to be institutional, but it's not, it cannot be the only change. Otherwise, it would have happened a long time ago. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think change just has to happen on multiple levels. As you were just talking there, I was thinking about that future design movement in Japan. And in one city where they were doing it, it called Uji, the local government had invited the citizens to do this, dressing up in as citizens from 2060 and making city plans. But after the process was finished, the citizens themselves set up their own future design group and now they invite the local politicians to come and join them. And it was a very nice example, I think, of new forms of community building and spreading through using these more imaginative kind of um, mechanisms. But there are, of course, there are questions, you know, can we spread these kinds of ideas fast enough? Like, can we spread the circular economy, you know, fast enough? Can we shift to post-growth uh, regenerative economies fast enough? And you know we we are facing a challenge of such scale. I mean, I remember a few years ago when it really struck me. I mean, this might sound completely obvious to you, but it wasn't to me. But that some of the fundamental institutions that we have, like consumer capitalism, representative democracy, nation states, were born in the Holocene. You know, they are products of the 18th and 19th century, and they are no longer fit for purpose in the Anthropocene. So 
they're not designed for the kinds of challenges we face like long-term challenges around climate and sea level rises and things like that they're not designed for that so we need different institutions and then that raises the question okay you're right i mean big institutions can seem so far away from our everyday lives and so difficult to change how do we possibly do that and do that fast enough you know and that's very difficult but one of the places i find hope and this is maybe going in a slightly different direction but you know in the 18th century there's this scottish economist adam smith who apparently at the time didn't even realize there was an, an industrial revolution emerging around him he couldn't see it because it was too fragmented you know and that's partly how where i find hope because if you connect the dots between all sorts of long-term regenerative action just think you've got the donut econ the donut economics adopted in amsterdam uh for city planning then that's then been copied by copenhagen then copied by carly in colombia and then by the government of costa rica using the donut as a donut economics as a model that's just one example of sort of regenerative thinking and then you've got all the legal movements campaigning for rights for future generations then you've got all the people who are you know people in the black lives matter movement talking about intergenerational racism like Leila F. Saad who wrote a wonderful book called Me and White Supremacy and on the first page she talks about being a good ancestor you know recognition of the sort of intergenerational nature of uh, racial injustice you know? um, and I think I guess this is maybe what change looks like but you're right it does of course have to come from the the grass roots because the elite politicians at the top they don't feel it, you know? And, and this is the message of Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, about the collapse of civilizations. Why do civilizations collapse? He says one of the main reasons is because the elites in economic and political power protect themselves from the impacts of what they've created and they drive their civilizations into the ground. Yes, sorry. Kirsten, did you want to say something? No, no, I was just nodding and agreeing the entire time. <laughs> In that sense, I think when you say that Adam Smith didn't even realize that the industrial revolution was going on and that, you know, it just, it, it, it was created and it became so big, the, um, right now the economic system is also, well, hugely problematic. And there is one question in the, in the chat box uh, from Alexandra and she asks, so what is the alternative that we should look for? Um, to the current system, so to the current uh, uh, economic capitalist system focused on continuous growth. Wilson, do you want to answer that? Or can I answer that? <laughs> you can start, or I can start. Um, you start. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess one one answer to that is what I mentioned. Like the, you know, the I think the the great thing about this moment in history we're in is that it's very different from after the 2008 financial crisis in the sense that I think there are more alternative ideas lying around. You know, one of the, the tragedies of 2008 crisis was that we basically bailed out the banks and, and kept the old system, right? But now we've got models like all sorts of people who are thinking about regenerative economies like Kate Raworth's donor economics model, like the circular economy model, the people interested in degrowth. So they're very clear alternatives out there um i mean i happen to be a fan of donut economics but you know there are other you know people there are well-being economy um frameworks and other things as well so i think we're not lacking alternatives um the question is trying to get enough cultural energy let's say um and political energy around challenging and changing economic structures i mean one of the very bad things that's happened in the UK this week, which is that the, 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 the finance ministry, the treasury commissioned a report on biodiversity. Um, it's called the Dasgupta report and it's come out, it's very, it's 600 pages long. So I've only started reading it, but it hasn't embraced the regenerative economy. It, it's, it's caught in national capital accounting, um, natural capital accounting and things like this. It's, you know, it's, these are massive struggles, but I think the alternatives are out there, you know, where people are doing them like the city of Amsterdam, you know, Amsterdam, you know, just one example, but you know, they got policies in place now, 50% circular by 2030, 
100% circular by 2050. By 2022, I think 10% of city procurement, you know, the stuff that is bought by the council, uh, by the city has to be circular, you know, and these are real changes, you know, and, and businesses then have to follow. This, this is tough stuff. Yes, uh, indeed. And then um, also f on this topic, for example, also Helsinki is doing really great work. I saw that they were they will be completely climate neutral by 2035. So I think on the scale of other places, that's really good. Um, but Can I just say with Helsinki also, there's a uh, if anybody's really interested in this stuff, there's a the Finnish government, uh, sort of government funded think tank about the future called Citra, S-I-T-R-A, have really good materials around regenerative economies, long-term thinking, future th literacy and things like that. They're called Citra. But sorry, uh, <laughs> Marie Monique, I interrupted you. No, I was just um, looking at some of the other questions that have been put in the chat. Um, and there is one person who is asking, so should we then curb the freedom of consumers then? And he is referring to Zygmunt Bauman. Um, so I was wondering what your take was on this, considering the magnitude of the problems. Wilson, do you have some thoughts? I guess the question would be, what, how do you define yourself as a consumer? Um, if the if if to consume means to rob uh, future generations of um, the right to live, then maybe we need to redefine what it means to be a consumer, um, and kind of think about how housing, which in, in the way the ways in which we can introduce radical love and and, and care uh, to. Um, uh, how we structure econ the economy and politics and, and, and all of these institutions that have an actual real uh, implication in how we live our lives. Um, I think when we when we when we talk about when we're talking about these kinds of things, we usually we often kind of frame them in ways where we are, we are we are stopping ourselves from doing things like um, not being like stop. How, curbing consumerism or curbing this or curbing that. Maybe it's, uh, it would be interesting to reframe it in a way where you're like, um, you're not curbing uh, consumerism, you're just granting uh, uh, yourself and fellow um, uh, humans a, um, a different way in which to approach uh, the future. Um, I think we need to stop coming from places of lack and scarcity and more about talk about abundance uh, because the world is abundant and the, uh, the, uh, the, the solutions to these problems are as abundant as the people on the planet. So let's give ourselves oh. a little bit more credit. I mean, I'm actually agree with you very much there, Filson, about the need to reframe the way we think about the relationship between consumerism and freedom. I mean, I'm all in favor of putting curbs on consumer choices. Why? Well, we've been doing it for hundreds of years and it's been okay. One of the big curbs that occurred in the, and limits put on consumer choices in the 18th century was the abolition of slavery and the slave trade in some countries. Now, that's a struggle that's gone on for a long time and continues to go on because of debt bondage. But if I, if I live in England, it's no longer easy for me to buy and sell a slave. That's a choice I don't have to own another human being to make my dinner for me. You know, now, of course, it gets played out in all sorts of other ways, you know, with the inequalities, uh, you know, with migration, refugees and so on. But we do put limits. And so it no longer is a kind of freedom that I feel I should have by right to buy and sell a slave. You know, and it felt OK to many parts of the world in the 18th century in Russia. Uh, in you know colonial countries in you know all, all, all sorts of places so then we move today we put limits on the kinds of things that we can make choices about you know uh, these things again happen all the time if i i don't live in london but i'm not allowed to drive a car into london without paying a fee you know uh, uh, you know i have to pay however much money it is um and then one day you know i think we should be putting limits on the amount of airplane flights that people can take, 
of course you know but it doesn't mean that there is no freedom left you know i just put my freedom in other areas and as philson is saying there is the abundance in all sorts of other realms you know i don't need to feel i find my meaning by saying i shop therefore i am you know i can find my meaning by look can i tell you something i did yesterday which gave me great joy i organized for my son who's 12 to play chess online with my father who's 87 and lives in australia a small thing it brought me such joy you know <laughs> and yes we had to buy a bit of internet time i guess and, and things like that but it wasn't a consumer choice it was a family connection intergenerational choice and ah oh, it was wonderful <laughs> and <laughs> Thanks. And there is um, Dirk is asking, um, so do you see ways to turn this extreme sense of individualism into more a sense of community again? And I guess also how? Um, well, let me just say something briefly about that. Then maybe Filson, you can say something. You know, I, um, where is it? Down here. Um, I once wrote this book called Empathy, a handbook for revolution. Okay, but now let me show you something. Okay, when the US, the United States edition came out, they changed the name to Empathy, why it matters and how to get it. So this was the, for an individualistic culture. Suddenly it was all about me, 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 me. Here it was about revolutionary social change. But, um, you know, part of the answer to the question, I think, is about how we shift from me to we and there's so many ways to think about that, but this, let me give you just one example. In Canada, there is a wonderful education project called Roots of Empathy, like the roots of a tree. And what they do is they invite babies into the classroom. So kids between the age of about five and 10, a real baby comes in with a parent, an instructor from the program, and the kids sit around the baby and they start talking about the baby. Why is the baby crying? Why is the baby laughing? They're trying to step into the baby's shoes. They're trying to empathize, what's called cognitive empathy. And they then use that as a jumping off point for talking about, well, what's it like to be a kid living on the streets of Kolkata or to be an old person in old people's home or something like that. Um, and then what's it like to, they also talk about empathy with future generations. Who is this baby going to be in the future? So it's an education program. Over a million children have done this, Roots of Empathy. It's one of the ways, just one, that we tackle the deep individualism that we've inherited. But I'm sure you have thoughts, Filsa. Yeah, I, I, I feel like individualism, individualism in and of itself is, is informed a lot by um, this disconnect uh, between one another. So not only from from one another but also from yourself uh, this idea that um, we are <laughs> we only matter because we are able to produce a certain amount of wealth for a certain amount of people and that's who and what we are we are mostly just workers um, working for the elite i feel like empathy require the uh, individualism uh, collectivism requires for us to kind of like kind of see one another again kind of reintroduce ourselves to each other um, and leave room and space for mistakes and room and space for uh, conflict um, without uh, kind of um, not having like uh, without taking away the other person's humanity so uh, bell hooks was talking about collective uh who do you want to be in your collective so she was talking about community and she said community is very easy to have with people you love and people you like <laughs> uh, it's when you have to invite people you do not that you're actually talking about radical love and radical change um, and inclusion in so you are trying to make people um almost everybody a part of your extended family uh even though they might have ideas or thoughts um that that do not sometimes clash with yours because she then talked about how she found community with a middle-aged white man who was uh, not the biggest feminist on the planet 
um, but his daughter was, and his daughter loved bell hooks and read all of her books. And while she, while she, while she was alive, would tell him to read read her books, read your books. Like you'll understand more of what I'm saying if you just understand what bell hooks. Uh, if you could just uh, read what I read, or kind of she was looking for a way to connect with him. And then she tragically died um, at a car in a car accident, and he found himself going into her things and uh, he found Belle's books and started reading them and contacted Belle and <laughs> Belle was in for, well, kind of tried to uh, bring him into her circle and then um, of course then she would have uh, some flag um, her peers asking her, are you sure you want to be hanging around with a middle-aged, with a middle-aged white man, you know? <laughs> it's like, not cool. <laughs> she literally said that it was not cool. <laughs> um, but he taught her a lot about what it meant to empathize with somebody, put yourself in somebody else's shoes and kind of uh, uh, see someone through a, 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 a process and of discovery and understanding. Um, and so I think uh, in order for us to kind of um, move more towards the we way of thinking we kind of had to uh, kind of re-establish connection with one another and re-establish a way in which we can we can we can uh, build upon uh, a relationship in which we can then um kind of move into uh the the world a different way when adrian's book uh, adrian marie brown when she's talking about emergent strategy is talking about using even the home and households as um a place where we can build roots and then those roots will connect to other households and it, be, uh, it could be an entire system um, uh, an ecosystem so kind of try and and, and foster ecosystems try and foster community um a very easy way of doing it is getting to know your neighbor uh kind of bringing some kind of neighborhood um i wouldn't say neighborhood watch because that's not right <laughs> but a kind of uh, uh collective like i have the most engaged neighbor <laughs> really right next to me uh miriam she um was is somebody who has um changed where we live the face of the of the neighborhood we live in because she has opened her door up for everyone and has tried very hard to engage with uh, the community around you so try uh, i think the more uh, there are big ways in which we can do this, but the small tiny ways in which we can try and do this is uh, engage with one another engage with people closest to you re-establish connections and uh move in from there you start small stop small steps and then um hopefully we start to see all of humanity as part of our community and all of humanity as part of our family. Uh, can can uh, I just add a little something to that, which you just made me think of as you were speaking there, Philson, which is, you know, in terms of putting your roots into your community, but also putting your roots into the past and, and having sometimes the uncomfortable encounters. You're talking about bell hooks that man. I was just thinking about how, remember last summer, um, when there was a, um, a protest in the city where I live in Oxford to bring down a statue of Cecil Rhodes, who was one of the architects of apartheid. And so I went there with my partner and we sat in the middle of the street and blocked the street with other protesters about this, this statue. Um, and I had this very interesting experience because the statue of Cecil Rhodes, this key figure in the apartheid regime was as part, part of a building in Oxford University where I had studied as an undergraduate. So on the one hand, on my left hand side was, I was a product of this white privilege, this inheritance on this side. And then I suddenly realized that about 200 meters in the other way was another library where I used to study 30 years ago, which was, um, it's called the Codrington Library, but it was built from slave money, sugar plantations in the Caribbean. And I felt like in this kind of pincer movement, this thing of my own history, um, of, of the, the privilege I was always carrying around with me. And then I had this other thought, which was kind of a more profound one in a way, that I was thinking about when I was a child growing up in Sydney and I walked into my high school for the first day, local government high school, I was 11, 12 years old. And I suddenly thought, huh, what made it possible for me to walk into that high school? It's because these were stolen lands. This land was stolen, right? I had never been taught that. It had never occurred to me until I was 49 years old, you know? And so I just think we need to have these conversations with our pasts. And I think these are one of the ways of 
you also overcome that individualistic myopia of the of the present. I think that was what is so interesting about the uh, your the wordage in the book, the good ancestors. It really how do you, like it made me think why why would um, would some would someone talk uh, about an ancestor because the ways in which we talk about ancestors um, would be classified as woo woo. <laughs> Uh, in, in the West, and so it was so interesting to me that um, a, a white man was writing a book about the white and uh, about being a good ancestor, and I was thinking, <laughs> how how did how did he how did he even come to choose that? You know, you could have easily just said um, we uh, we are trying to make sure that future uh, future generations are. Uh, you could have centered the book around future generations and tried to say, yeah, we are we are we are we are trying to find ways and modes of. of, of existing that does not jeopardize future transitions, but you decided to pull the idea of ancestry in there, uh, that idea of history. And um, one of the things that um, that I've noticed very, very much, like we as people of uh, color are very, very uh, connected to our ancestors and our ancestry because of the um, the um, disruption of colonialism and so we've had to go back to try and find and kind of piece together our own histories and our own stories but that disruption has not existed um, by the oppressor and so the this the this the the of i feel for, for like um, um for western culture it is the the the, the separation between ancestor and you as an individual now is something that was that it's almost chosen. It's almost something that was chosen. Like um, it, it had. It wasn't informed by trauma. It wasn't informed by uh, separation or forced um, a forced separation. And so um, when we were uh, earlier, when we were discussing uh, earlier last year, when we were discussing Adrian Marie Brown's book, I had this. I made this plea to everyone in in, in the audience, and I asked them to connect with their ancestors and talk to their ancestors and heal those wounds because in order for them to heal wounds here now with the people around them, they're gonna to have to heal generational wounds as well. They also have generational work to do, just like we do. And um, the <laughs> a few people walked out, but, <laughs> but it was such an interesting concept to introduce. And I wonder if um, for you, it was also something that you um, had to kind of overcome in a way um, when you were uh, looking into writing the book. Well, I think, that, I mean, just to say something briefly on this is that, you know, I'm a child of refugees and, um, you know, my father was a refugee from Poland to Australia after the Second World War. And in fact, just the other day, I was involved in um, making a, a TV program for a Dutch TV program called um, Tegentlich, I think it's called Tegentlich. And I, they asked me to find family photos. Well, most of my family photos were destroyed in the Second World War. There, there, there is not, you know, the, the photos going back to then, but nothing before. And many of the memories have been destroyed by war as well. And the family connections and the ancestral connections and things. So I think, you know, if I'm looking for the, the, the deeper psychological reasons, maybe why I wrote this book, you know, um, as well as caring about future generations uh, and caring about the kind of conceptual emergency of our lack of thinking about long-term thinking, I think it's also, and I'm just realizing this now, it's, it's it's part of a way of trying to make more of an intergenerational connection in my own uh, own life because it's been partly severed by you know capitalist consumer structures but it's also been severed by geography war you know many of my relatives were murdered in the holocaust their stories are gone you know um, they were they were, my my rabbi great grandfather had to dig his own grave and was shot in it you know, and all his family except one survivor, you know, and, and so, but you carry this with you, you know, knowing that there's an ancestry there, but it's sort of difficult to it is. touch. Yeah. I think the, uh, Sadia Hartman's work is, uh, has, has come to mean a lot to, uh, to me in that um, she talks about going back into the archive and then critical fantabulation and going back into the archive and then creating um, your own um, idea of what could have happened with the information that you can find. So this puzzle you kind of put together and you kind of like, um, you cement it with your own 
hopes of what that could have meant uh, for your ancestor and for you now. So, yeah, um, I could talk about it forever. <laughs> I'm sure there are other questions in the chat that we I'm must sure answer. I'm sure that's why. I actually have a, a question myself um, because the as you wrote in the book, it's really hard for us. On the one hand. Uh, you can say that we're homo prospectus so that we can really plan in the long term and that we can actually be good at it. Uh, and on the other hand, there is the, the, the distraction um, or the, the, the present day that, that, yeah, that we struggle with this, this finding this connection and, 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 um, and um, kind of Put it, putting ourselves into the future uh, and my my question was um, so this idea of intergenerational justice is really an important one uh, and it's very powerful but I wonder how can we take care or how can we put our um, energy and our time into taking care of the well-being of people that are not even there yet when there are so many people in the world still today um, who are living in dreadful conditions. And, and then I, I think, oh, shouldn't we take care of them first and then of the others? Or I was wondering what your um, perspective was on this. Yes, I mean, the, the comedian Groucho Marx once said, why should I care about future generations? What have they ever done for me? And, um, but I think that's a real issue for in real people's lives because they're dealing with their own shit that's going on in their life, right? There are 220 million migrants and refugees around the world. There'll be 450 million by 2050, probably. So they're dealing with their immediate problems, of course. Um, I think one of the things that I found really fascinating researching this book is to discover how much long-term thinking there is in communities who are on the socioeconomic margins, you know, that, I mean, if you think of Native American communities who are using seventh generation decision making, they're not privileged members of society with great amounts of security, quite the opposite. Yet they still have the cultural connection with the long term and between the interdependence with the living world. The same with uh, Maori communities in Aotearoa, New Zealand, or often you find them amongst the refugee communities I grew up with who are really caring about wanting to pass on culture for example, language, food, all sorts of things. And often the narrowest sense of long-term thinking and legacy comes from the most privileged parts of society. Oh, I'm an aristocrat who wants to pass on my house to my child and I don't really care about anybody else. You know? um, but of course there are tensions here you know, between the emergencies of the present and the emergencies of the future. What does one do? And I think there are no easy answers here. What I do know, of course, is the way, for example, government, governments make decisions about the long term is they, you know, anyone who's studied any economics will know about the idea of discounting. The way when governments make long term investment decisions, they literally diminish the value of future people when they're doing cost benefit analysis. And that is a great form of intergenerational justice, which must be, you know, challenged. Um, so I think it is hard to. Uh, one more thing I would say is that if you look at the, the future generations commissioner in Wales, when she faces this problem, uh, what she does is she tends to focus, her name's Sophie Howe, she's really fantastic. She tries to focus on policies that help both future and current and future generations as a sort of a bridge. So things like, you know, green energy, you know, trans green transport infrastructure and things like that. You know, it doesn't solve all problems, but it's a, it's a way of bringing people and other politicians along for the beginning of the journey, let's say, towards a longer now civilization. But you know, none, you know, none of this is easy, easy stuff. Yeah, I think I would just add that um, taking care of one another also means that you're taking care of um, future generations. Just come back to that. Um, uh, thought experiment where you're standing in the middle and you look to your left and you look to your right if you see your, your ancestors and your descendants then you know you're okay so take care of the now so that you can take care of the later and because they took care of their now you exist That's beautiful. Um, 
so it's almost time so i think we're gonna do a last question um and i am quickly looking for the question that uh so mary was asking uh how can i inspire other people in daily life to think in this kind of way ah <laughs> How do you inspire other people? Look, I, I tell you where I think in a way it goes back to something Filson was talking about, which is about, in a sense, the power of conversation. Um, I just want to show you something very briefly, if I can, in this, my copy of this book, if I can find the right page. Um, ah, now I wish I could show you on the screen probably, but here in the book is a menu of conversation questions. Questions to have with family and loved ones and strangers about long-term thinking, like, what legacy do you want to leave for your family, your community, for the living world? Or what for you are the most powerful reasons for caring about future generations? I think in a sense, so much social transformation comes from conversation, actually. Saying things you haven't said before to people you maybe don't talk about things with very much. This is the like the mycorrhizal connections of the roots, you know, um, that I think are so fundamental. So you know, there's a million things, you know, although I believe these problems we face are of such urgency, we must act collectively, absolutely. But I also believe we need to have these conversations to make it normal to talk about ancestors. <laughs> you know, like, Filson, you and I, we can talk about this for hours. Probably everybody can, if probably. you gave them the space. But this is the bridge, you know, this is part of it. And I think it connects with, you know, we all get slightly bored looking at, human development reports and statistics about, you know, SDGs and so on, and they have their role, but we also need to be having face-to-face -face conversations, talking about those very issues. That's where the values change in us. Mm -hmm. And yeah. kind of our own abilities to, um, to have those conversations without it being uh, weird. <laughs> so I trust the transformative nature of um, being present in your body and holding space for somebody else to be present in theirs and sharing that experience in humanity. I think that's a, a great way uh, in which we can end. Um, I want to thank everyone and especially the speakers for attending tonight.